Happy Sabbath. You know, I must confess to you, I didn't understand a word that was set up on the platform. It's incredible. If you're on the platform, you don't know what people are saying. So I assume, Mark, that you were saying some nice things about me. I'm not sure. Yeah, I didn't think so, because the people were grimacing as I was looking over. Um, anyway, it is great to be at Vallejo Drive, amen? Man, every time I come to this place, I get hugs and, 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 and handshakes and welcome and everything else. I mean, this place is so friendly, you know. You just are, are, are so fortunate that you are able to worship here. Um, so before we begin, let's pray. Our Father God, this is the day that you have made. This is a precious day, Lord. Let us not, not take it for granted because you created it just with us in mind. Lord, we've come here to worship you and to be inspired through your spirit. May we hear you speaking to us and may we leave this place invigorated with confidence knowing that we serve a mighty God. We ask now that your spirit will lead us in worship as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me begin by asking a question. Hi, Jim. How are you? How is everybody? You know, we have this concept of happy Sabbath, right? Happy Sabbath where we get up and we're just raring to go to church. Amen. 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 Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, amen. However, the truth is, truth be told, that sometimes before we get to church, uh, our life is not so, so peaceful as we would like it to be, amen? We come uh, to church with issues on our mind, and especially the world today. I mean, uh, there are so many things happening in this world today that it would not be unusual for us to have some anxiety about what's going on on this planet right now. However, sometimes the cares of this world so consume us that the idea of having one more thing to do just seems to paralyze us, even going to church. You know, uh, the story is told one Sabbath morning, a woman woke her husband up and she said, honey, it's time to go to church. And she prodded him, get up, get up. And he looked at her and he said, sweetheart, I just don't feel like it. No, not today. And she said, no, you've got to go. He said, you can't make me. Give me one good reason why I should go to church. And she said, sweetheart, you're the pastor. Now, we laugh at that, but I will tell you, sometimes I've gotten up that way. Do I really have to go to church? I met this greeter at the Temple City Church. I came early, and she was there very modestly dressed, obviously not a person of means. However, I saw something in her eye that was a twinkle. You know what I mean? Just a, a twinkle of happiness, a twinkle of peace. And so I said to her, you know what? Uh, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? And she said, uh, well, uh, I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to get to the Temple City Church. I said, 5 o'clock in the morning? Where do you live? And she said, oh, I really don't live that far. The thing is, I have to take the bus. 
And by the time I make all the transfers, it takes me around two and a half hours to get to church every Sabbath. And I said to her, why do you do that? Aren't there any closer churches to you? And she said, yes, there are closer churches, but I come here because I want to get that message of hope. Isn't that incredible? She said, I live in a very stressful neighborhood, uh, a lot of violence there, and I need that message of hope to get me through. And she said, on top of that, you know what? When I ride that bus on the way to church, I pray to God, Lord, help me to find somebody who I can talk to. And she says, many times I meet a stranger who is down and out, and I just share with him the good news of Jesus. Amen? And, and it just invigorates me. Even though it takes me that long, I am just happy to be here. Um, now, perhaps this morning, you've come here with some giants on your shoulders. Amen? You know, I know we put on our Sabbath best, right? We're all dressed up. We look good, smell good, and everything else. But some of us are carrying burdens. Isn't that true? The burden of a career loss. The burden of a troubled relationship. The burden of bitterness. The burden of frustration, of disappointment at yourself, the burden of not being able to forgive someone that you have, have harbored malice at, the burden of addictions that you may have tried to overcome for years in your life. I have good news for you this morning. For those of you who came home or came here on a bus or you walked or you drove your car, there is what I call the drive home point. And you know what the drive home point is? It's the point that you're thinking about when you're what? Driving home. And here's the point. In Jesus' name, you can slay your giant. Oh, let me say that again. I don't think you were listening. In Jesus' name, you can slay your giant. And the church said, Amen. Amen. That's what I thought you were saying. You know, sometimes we make way too much of our giants. And so I wanted to review with you a little bit about the giant Goliath, you know, that's found in first, in chapter 17 of Samuel, first 17. Now this guy was like 10 feet tall. He was a mature warrior. He was boastful and he had that boast on the basis of his experience of being able to decimate anyone who came against him. And he did this for 40 days and 40 nights. You know, do you have a giant like that in your life that seems to, uh, to badger you day in and day out. Anybody want to raise your hand? I've got mine up. Oh, man, I've got some giants in my life sometimes. And so the first thing I learned out of my own experience here is that we have got to quit telling our God about the power of our giants and begin to tell our giants about the power of our ominous, empowering God. Amen? 
See, the messages at times that we give to God is like, this is so hopeless. In fact, we are suggesting to God, I don't think you can do anything about this. I guess I just have to live with this giant. And so we walk around intimidated and defeated as if that's just our lot in life. Now, let me say this right now. I love young people, young teenagers, because really this is one message where the older people will learn from the younger. Amen? And so anyway, the older people were saying, you know, look at this guy. He's a man of experience. He's never lost a battle. Man, this guy is humongous. And here he's coming against the children of God. And all he's saying is that bring somebody out to defeat me and you win. But if I win, then you will be enslaved. And Saul and the children of Israel looked at this guy and saw him as an immovable foe. And then up walks this young man named David, who was no more than a teenager. He really wasn't. No more than a teenager. And rather than seeing an immovable foe, he saw a big target. Isn't that incredible? A big target. See, he addressed him and he said, you are nothing but an uncircumcised Philistine. That's what you are. Isn't that incredible? Now, was he willing to put his action behind his words? Mark, was he willing to do that? Because, see, he engaged and once you engage, game on. Amen? Game on. And so he looked at this giant and he said, you know what? You say we are from the armies of Saul, but you don't get it. We are actually from the armies of the living God. His brothers didn't help the situation. No. They told David to be quiet. You're just a kid. Leave us alone. You know, sometimes when we're on the brink of victory, there will be naysayers around us. Amen? You ever seen that? Naysayers among you who just as you're about to have the victory, they come in and say, no, 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 impossible. Let me share with you a personal story. For 22 years of my life, I had a severe speech impediment. I mean, I could never talk on the telephone. I could not have any conversation with anybody and not block. I was like, it was like driving a stick shift, you know what I mean? And you, you pop the clutch, you know, like that. Well, that's how I talked, or I should say, didn't talk. And when I, 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 I proposed to my wife, you know, to be married, I said, you wouldn't, what? Really? <laughs> and she in her graciousness said, yes! I guess she read the intent of my heart. And so I was plagued with this impediment for 22 years of my life. It was a literal prison. I had a conversation with, with a pastor. The conference hired me, you know that? Incredible. Mark, they hired me 
as a student missionary for $100 a month on room and board. Now that's the most pay I'd ever gotten and so I took it. And my first assignment was door-to-door -door ministry. I don't care if you don't have a speech impediment. When you do door-to-door -door ministry, you're going to stutter. And so here I was at the door, you know, blocking everything. The people would open the door and they would say, what do you want? And I'd be going, and they would close the door on me like I was some nut. And really, I was. <laughs> they weren't far off. And so I told my senior pastor, I'm done. I'm wasting the conference's money. And he said, before you go, I want you to talk to a pastor. And so I went down to Los Angeles and I had this conversation with Lloyd Wyman, who was the pastor of the White Memorial Church at that time. And he said, Gerard, if God has called you, let him take care of that problem. What do you think? What do you think? Well, I, I got into my Jeep and I drove north on Highway 14, north on Highway 14 in my Jeep. And as I was driving, I was almost at the Palmdale Church at the time, and I felt this warm sensation on my neck, and I had no idea what that was about. But I got to the church and I got out of my Jeep and I walked into the church and some members were saying to me you know what and i said why what's going on and i began talking blah, 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 and and i didn't realize what was going on and they said to me pastor you're talking i was in shock we just had a prayer meeting for you at the church and God loosed your tongue 22 years but then I went home and I talked to my father and my father said oh come on that's impossible it's a fluke see sometimes you got those naysayers in your life and sometimes they can be your parents Just a fluke. It'll never last. Forty-three years later, I guess my dad was wrong. I guess he was wrong. See, sometimes as Christians, we live our lives as if we were atheists. You know what I mean? You know, we say we believe in God, but then when push comes to shove, we deny his power. Amen. He can fix other people, but not me. I saw this guy walking on campus over at Chafee College, and he had on his hat, Jesus, with a cross. Jesus. And I thought, oh, interesting. This guy must be a Christian, right, Mark? I mean, wouldn't you think that? You know, he got a Jesus thing and a, and a cross thing. And out of his mouth, all this guy was doing was complaining about the country and complaining about the church and complaining about his neighbors and complaining. And I began to wonder, did you find that hat somewhere? Because I don't think you realize what it says on your head. So here was Goliath, big guy, like we saw. A man who was mature, had armor, had a spear, had experience, had an armor bearer, but he lacked one thing, right? You know what he lacked? He did not know God. And here was this young man, a teenager. Some say he would have to be at most 17 years old. Do we have any 17 year olds here in church here this morning? Raise your hands. Under 20, raise your hands. Under 20. 
Okay, come on, come on. Let me see you. Under 20. Okay, I'm telling you, God will use you when us old people can't see a way. Amen? Man, this was tremendous. And here, these old older people are immobilized by this intimidating foe and here comes this teenager and calls it like it is you are just an uncircumcised philistine would you have loved to be there i would have said to that kid kid kid, kid tone it down a little bit you're gonna make him upset See, but uh, Goliath had made a huge mistake. He underestimated his antagonist, didn't he? There's another way to make a huge mistake. Underestimate God. And so here they were, big giant of a man, and probably a person my height, around six feet. Now, I like to say I'm six feet, but Mark lost a few inches over time, you know, so I could be like 5'10". Okay, but anyway, here's David. with faith in God and a sling against a giant with experience and a spear. Who do you think is going to win? Well, I would like to suggest to you that Goliath had the odds that were stacked against him. Yeah, you know, we say all the times, oh, how could a little boy do something like this well see we forget something about David David was not just a shepherd he was a what a slinger a slinger you know uh, in archaeology we learn that warfare in those days had three levels one was the infantry man and the next level was the archers and the slingers. And the last level was the cavalry. And so here an infantryman, Goliath, who was a big target, is coming against a slinger who in those days, it says, was able to hit a target a hair's breadth with a stone, a hair's breadth. It was like, Goliath is like a karate guy. You know what I'm saying? He's ominous, and he comes against this guy who's got a gun. Who do you think is going to win? But that was the human level. There was one more level. David, he came against this giant in the name of God. Do you hear me? In the name of God. So not only was Goliath outgunned, he was outfaithed. Outfaithed. And by that I mean this. See, if David had walked up to him flexing his muscle and said, you know, Goliath, I'm going to take you down. He would have lost in a heartbeat. Saul offered him his armor. And no, 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 no. He said, uh, uh, I don't want that armor. I've got to do this battle on God's terms. And so he came there with a sling in his hand and faith in God. Because I would like to suggest to you that even though on a human level, Goliath was out, outpaced by David, what if David had missed? Hmm. 
there was only one chance to get it right. See, sometimes in our life, there's only one chance to get it right. And so it's not enough that we have the right armament. We must also carry with us faith in God. And so you've all heard the story of Hacksaw Ridge. Have you heard that story of Desmond Doss? Have you? A young man. Again, a young man who came on the field with what? With no guns. With no guns. But he came on the field with faith in God. And here's my point. What we need to remember is rather than flexing our muscles, we need to flex our faith. Isn't that incredible? And so here he was, Desmond Doss, no gun, refusing to kill anyone. Under the fire of the enemy, he rescued some say 80, 80 to 100 people. How did that happen? Because Desmond Doss was flexing his faith. Friends, when we come in the name of Jesus, we bring with us all of the resources of heaven. Amen. When we come in the name of Jesus, we come in the name of our creator, our sustainer, our redeemer, our friend. Sometimes in times of highest crisis, we see how that friend will come through. You know, around 14 years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer in the third stage. And I was thinking, oh boy, I've heard of other people who have had, had cancer in this stage and they're all dead. And so I was facing surgery and I ask God, you know, before I go in, I just want to know one thing. I need to know that there is an Adventist presence here in the hospital. Now you might say, why does it have to be Adventist? And my answer is, because. I was at USC. How are we going to have that? I thought, well, that's God's problem, not mine. And so I went to the blood draw and uh, I told the guy, I'm a Seventh day Adventist. He goes, Okay, great. And he belonged to the Church of God. And then all of a sudden, in the blood draw, this man walks in. And he was the man who I had dealt with in the pre-surgery. Really kind, gentle man. Well, he came looking for me in the blood draw area, and my son happened to be sitting there who was going to La Sierra University, you know, and he had the shirt, La Sierra University. And he looked at my son, he said, La Sierra University, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? And my son said, yes, I am. Now, my wife was in the room at the time, so she will substantiate. I'm not hallucinating here. And, and so uh, 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 he said, uh, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist too. And my son said, you're a Seventh-day Adventist? I think my, my dad would like to hear that because one of the things he told me is that he wanted to have an SDA presence uh, to just oh, kind of assure him. And so he walks into the blood draw and he says, I understand that you're looking for a Seventh-day Adventist. I said, yes, I am. And I explain to him why about my prayer. And he said, well, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. And I thought, wow, 
this is incredible. And so I asked him, what's your name? And he says, my name is Garnett. Garnett? Hmm. I was the pastor of the West Covina Hills Church for nine years, and there was a Garnett there named Bertha. And, and Bertha was a good friend, a prayer partner of my mother. And he said, Bertha is my mom. Uh, can I hear an amen? When God answers prayer, he does it in a mighty way. A mighty way. I didn't expect it. Not like that. And all of a sudden, I had peace over myself. And I just thought, okay, God, if you care about that little of a detail, what I am about to face is okay. And I went into that surgery with peace on my heart. In the name of Jesus, the world was made. In the name of Jesus, the Red Sea was parted. In the name of Jesus, Lazarus was resurrected. In the name of Jesus, any giant in your life can be slain in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus. What do you do with this information? When we commit ourselves to Jesus, at that moment, we become a part of a faith community. And that name and all the power behind it is ours. Isn't that incredible? It makes me just Absolutely, I'm silent about it. Really? Yes. That name, in that name, all the power of heaven comes with it. Number two, rather than flex our muscles, we can then flex our faith. Number three, as a daily routine, make it a point in your life to praise God for every breath you take. Can you do that? Amen. See, I have learned one thing, and that is do not take your breath of life for granted because it can be gone on the way home today. This is not to scare, it's to share what our predicament is like on this, on this planet. See, but in the name of Jesus, it doesn't matter if we're gone on the way home, except to our family, of course. It doesn't matter, because in the name of Jesus, we will be resurrected. Amen. See, there is no more powerful name. He is our sufficiency. He is our glory. And when we are faced with giants, we need to quit telling God about how big our giants are and begin to tell our giants about the empowering presence of God in our life. Amen. Church, we are the army of the living God. There is literally nothing 
that can overcome the church. Nothing. Elder Larry Cavanis shared this promise with me that's found in Desire of Ages. I loved that man. I worked with him for 18 years, and he loved this conference. Amen? And your new president loves this conference. He does. He cares about it. However, Larry Kavanagh would read this quote over and over to us and remind us, you know, Gerard, you know, region directors, you know, ADCOM, never forget this. Whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your case before the Lord. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. The will, the way will be open for you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will you become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest in casting them upon the burden bearer. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future, but Jesus sees the end from the beginning in every difficulty. He has his way prepared to bring relief. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find their perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. Amen. Friends, I invite you to join me in this closing prayer of invitation. The prayer that says, Almighty God, why do we do it? Why do we forget about you? Why do we forget? Why do we focus on the giants in our lives and not on the God who creates heaven and earth? Why do we do it? Lord, help us to receive this power that you have for us and be led to see that in the name of Jesus is every power we need to overcome the giants in our lives. If you will join with me, I invite you to stand with me as we pray. Our Father God, incredible, incredible how we, we let the giants in our lives, which are just immovable targets, get in the way of intimidating us and saying to us that we are captive to them. No, no, not so. In the name of Jesus, the world was created. In the name of Jesus, the world is sustained. In the name of Jesus, we will be resurrected. In the name of Jesus, we are made whole. In the name of Jesus, we come against every giant in our lives. And in that name, we overcome. Lord, we stand in your presence as your people knowing that the strength that resides within us is a strength of trust and faith in you. It's not about what we can do. It's about who we can trust. And we trust you, O oh Father. Let us live each day with the understanding and the recognition that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that even though we don't see you are there in the darkness of our lives and you will create light where there is no vision because you are God.
Lord, there are young people among us who are the slingers that you have called. I pray for each one of them, Lord. Help them to lead the church in a new understanding of who you are. We thank you so much for this truth. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.